Hey guys, welcome back to Material UI series. I know I haven't made a video in this playlist for a while, but we're gonna get back to it and we're gonna start working on styling in this video. But the very first thing I'd like to do is I'd like to update some of the dependencies here. So the first thing I'll do is I'm gonna go to package JSON and I'm gonna update the React as well as the React DOM dependencies to 16.3.1. Also, I'm gonna add a caret in front of them. And for React scripts, I'm actually going to go to npmjs.org. So this would be React scripts. And the current version is 1.14. So that's the exact one we're going to use over here. So what I will do is I'll add a caret and then the version. All right, so that's going to update the core dependencies. But I'd also like to update my chill UI. So what I'll do is I'll re-add it. And the latest version so far has been one beta 41 that's the one we're going to add and besides that we also need to update material ui icons so in fact what happened is material ui icons has been deprecated and we're actually going to see it in a second material ui icons let's see right so this is the library we're actually going to use so we have to re-add it as a dependency so i'll add a new dependency let's search for that library and let's remove the at sign Material UI icons, there we go, that's the one. And the current version is beta 42, so I'll re-add it. So what's gonna happen now is it won't be able to find some of the icons that we're using in the application. There we go, we got a dependency not found error. So what we can do here is we can go to the dialog and we can replace the import statement to that exact new path, okay? So we're grabbing the add icon from material UI slash icons, like that. So make sure you update the path and we also have to do the same thing over here because we're using the edit and delete icons so i'm going to update it and then it's going to work okay the other thing we're going to fix is if you remember in form js we had this component will receive props method now if you know in react 16 there's actually been a change to lifecycle methods in fact some of them also be deprecated so if we look for a component will receive props that's one of the candidates to be removed in react 18 or 17 i believe so as you can see they have a warning here in the documentation the recommended approach for now is to use the static get derived state from props and what i'm going to do here is i'm actually going to change this to a static method we're still going to have the next props object that looks something like this we also have access to the previous state which we don't actually need in this case but instead of setting the state all we have to do is basically return the new exercise object as you can see here if i click on edit on the overhead press we can see the form popping up we can also edit other exercises and as you can see the form is getting updated just like before and the only problem with this approach is if i refresh the page and if I go to the form, so I'll click on the plus icon to create a new exercise, you could see that we actually get an error in the console. And it's basically complaining about the value that we return. So in this case, the exercise is undefined. And that's because the value of the exercise property is undefined, the one that we actually pass to this component. So what we can do here is we can actually have a condition that will basically check if the exercise is falsy. And in this case, it's only going to be true if the exercise is undefined. And if that's the case, we're going to return null. Otherwise, we're actually going to return the exercise object. So that's going to alleviate the warning. So if I click on the plus, we don't get the error any longer. And the very last bug that I actually noticed is if we go to app.js, one of the methods over here resets the edit mode to false, and it also resets the exercise to an empty object when you are deleting the exercise. So this actually makes sense if I have an exercise selected, let's say overhead press and I try to delete it, well, that actually resets the currently selected exercise to an empty object. And we do that because if I, let's say, want to edit something, but then I also delete it, well, I shouldn't be able to edit it any longer because the exercise does not actually exist in the store. Now, that works for the exercises that we want to delete, but let's say what if I select dips and I want to delete barbell curls? Well, that's gonna reset the currently selected exercise even though it still exists in the store. So one thing we can do here is we can actually check if the ID of the currently selected exercise, so that's coming from the previous state object, if that ID actually matches the ID that we want to delete. So if that's the case, we're gonna have to reset 
the currently selected exercise to an empty object. But otherwise we can just simply set it to the exercise itself. And I know it's a bit redundant because we're basically resetting the exercise to the same exact object. So you, what you could do in the end, instead of passing um, an actual object, right? So what you can do is you could have a function that basically creates the new state object. And then you can have your conditions that says, well, if the exercise ID matches the ID of the exercise that needs to be deleted, then you can basically have your exercise being set on the new state, right? So you, you have your new state dot exercise, and you could set that to an empty object. I'm not going to go into that. And I think for this small example, even though it's not the most efficient approach, as you can see, it's, I think it's perfectly fine in this, in this context. And the same thing we'll do for the edit mode. So what I'm going to do is I'm also going to have a ternary expression, and we're going to check if the exercise ID matches the ID of the exercise that needs to be deleted. And if that's true, we're going to have to reset the edit mode to false because we cannot, uh, we can no longer edit that exercise because it's being deleted. Otherwise, we'll reset the edit mode to its same value. So we're going to have to grab it from the previous state like that. So I'm going to save it. And right now, so what we can do is we can actually delete exercises. We can also edit them. But more importantly, let's say if I select, let's say pull-ups, and if I delete pull-ups, well, that's going to reset the current exercise. But let's say I have dips selected and I want to delete deadlifts. Well, that's fine. That's not going to affect the dips, right? Because I'm still able to see them. And the same thing in the edit mode. So if I am editing dips, for example, and if I delete squats, that's not going to affect my dips. And in fact, I'm still able to edit them. So let's say we're going to edit the title and I can save it and there's no errors in the console, as you can see. Now, as far as uh, React 16.3 context API, if you guys are interested, we can actually dedicate a separate video for that because we do have some of the components that need to receive some of the props all the way from the app component. And we end up passing them through the intermediate components. So for example, the header has a form, as you can see, and the form requires muscles as well as on create. Well, the header itself doesn't need to know about the onCreate function. So this would be a good scenario for a context. So what I mean by that is we could actually store the onCreate function on the context and we could have a consumer. We could transform the form into a consumer that receives that prop. And that way we don't have to pass the onExerciseCreate property to the header because the header basically in this case acts as a as an intermediary component between the two. If you guys want to see that, let me know, and perhaps we can dedicate a video for the context API in React 16.3. But we're going to move on for now, and we're actually going to finally look at styling in Material UI. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go back to, let's say, a form.js file. And I've already shown you an interesting way to define styles in Material UI. What we've used so far was mostly a, an inline approach to styling. So for example, inside of index.js for the exercise component, we have the style property that contains a paper element, which is just basically an object and the paper is simply a property of that object. Now that object has a value, excuse me, that property, paper property has a value of an object and that object contains an interesting structure which basically resembles CSS styles. Now, of course, the keys have to be comma cased. So, for example, I can't do something like margin top with the dash, of course, because the dash is not a valid character for a for an object key. So, what I have to do is I have to comma case them. Now, this approach has nothing to do with Material UI in and of itself because this approach can work with React out of the box. So, what we do is we reference that style property right in one of the components so this for example this paper component needs to have a style so what we do is we basically inject the paper object from the style property and that's going to work fine in most cases but what if you wanted to add media queries or what if you wanted to add a hover event on an element let's say a button right so in, in cases where styling needs to be more advanced we could actually resort to the with style helper function. So I think the first thing I have to mention is that in the past, Material UI used to rely on less 
the less preprocessor for styling, but they eventually moved on to inline styling. But like I mentioned, inline styling has its own disadvantages and limitations as well. So what they ended up doing for Material UI Next is they ended up going with the CSS in JavaScript styling solution. And what they ended up using actually is the JSS library. Now, JSS is basically a tool that allows you to write CSS in JavaScript. So what your code might look like is something like this. So like I said, we have a styles object, which can have different classes. So the top level keys are basically class names. So let's say a button, a call to action button, and as you can see, also a media query with the button inside. And then we can also have hover events, and like I said, media queries, and a lot more functionality than that. So what ends up happening in the end is once you have your styles, you could actually transform them into classes that you end up using on actual HTML elements. And of course, there's also another library that's adapted for React, which is known as React JSS. If you're interested to know more about it, make sure to go to the documentation on GitHub. And as you can see, this example over here actually looks very similar to Material UI. So we end up having a styles object. Again, we have a button class, a label class, and we have properties inside of those objects. And then we have the inject sheet call where we pass the styles. So this inject sheet is basically a higher order component. So what we do is we wrap our button component, a normal React component, with that inject sheet function. And what it does is it actually passes those styles as classes to the component as a prop. So we can start using those classes on the elements. So for example, we can assign the button class on the button, and we can also assign the label class on the span. And as you can see already, it resembles what Material UI uses internally. And in Material UI, instead of inject uh, sheet method, there's another one that's known as with styles. It's also a higher order component. And it's actually more customizable and more powerful because it also allows you to have reference to the theme. So what we can do here is we can actually console log the theme just to see what properties it contains. So I'm going to open up the console. Let's click on the plus icon. That's going to open up the form. And as you can see here, we get a huge object. The one thing you might notice is the palette property that also contains a bunch of colors. So for example, the primary color, you can see the main color. That's the one that we you see in the header over there in the application. So that's the blue color. And there's other variations of that color, like the light one, the dark one, and the contrast text. So that's the white color you see in the header over here. So we're going to explore the theme object eventually in more detail. But for now, what I'd like to show you is how we can move on from inline styling to the more advanced with style HOC.